There's a direct connection between the diversion of water in the upper Gila River and the health status and economic status of Pimas and Maricopas. In the 1890s, water simply stopped coming down the Gila River. Upstream, water from the Gila was diverted by dams and water projects, giving white settlers, farmers, ranchers, and mining interests the water they needed. And we were dependent upon that water to grow crops, to provide for ourselves. Not even the 1908 Supreme Court decision upholding water rights for all Native Americans could protect the Pima. The Coolidge Dam. In 1930, one of the largest in the world. Its promise, to provide water for everyone, this time including the Pima. Former President Calvin Coolidge celebrated its opening with politicians and businessmen. They dined on china, crystal, and linen. The Pima ate bagged lunches on makeshift tables. Coolidge passed the peace pipe, but in the end, the Pima got little of the water, again. We were practically without water for almost an entire century. We were among the poorest people in the United States of America, as are Indians who live in other reservations and still are in that situation. Unable to grow crops, unable to get out and, and work in the fields, unable to develop economically because of the lack of water for almost 100 years was just, that's an absolute shame as far as this country is concerned, as far as the state of Arizona is concerned. What is a metaphor for the rest of the country to try to think about in terms of damming the rivers? It would be like saying to this entire country, okay, survive now without money. And how would you do that? How would you change your entire economy? How would you change your entire culture? How would you change your entire lifestyle? And would you be successful? Would people die? And the Pima did die, but they died from starvation not from diabetes. A survey conducted in 1902 found only one case of diabetes among the Pima. But within 30 years of building the Coolidge Dam, there were more than 500. If we had not dammed the rivers back in the 1920s and 1930s, we wouldn't be able to have this lifestyle that we enjoy in Arizona with swimming pools and golf courses and artificial lakes. And with this lifestyle, we're really living outside the laws of nature. And what people, I think, generally speaking, don't realize is that all of the prosperity of Phoenix and the prosperity of this entire state was built on the backs of the health of the local tribes. Pimas lived a very, very difficult life at the bottom of the economic scale. We had almost no recourse except to become dependent upon governmental benefits. Shortly after the dams were built, the U.S. military began distributing free commodity foods to Native Americans. And it definitely brought us through the hard times. This is the commodities building where they host the commodity food. This is where people used to come get their, their cheese, their beans and their grape juice and stuff. They used to be just rows and rows and rows and rows of those. But this surplus food, white flour, cheese, refined sugar, lard, canned foods, is a diabetic's nightmare, as it was for Terrell's neighbor. They asked her how many people are in your household, and she said about five. And the guy said, well, you can get five boxes of food. And there was chips and candy and canned food. And I thought, well, that's an idea. There's a nice idea about having food, but it's just the wrong kind of food. And uh, I asked her, I said, so what kind of, like, were there any kind of normal food? She goes, well, there were cans of gravy. It was not until 1996 that fresh produce was offered in the program, and authentic traditional foods are still not included. When we think of traditional American Indian food, for example, fry bread is one of the things that comes to mind. Well, in truth, tribes did not have fried bread historically. The roots of fry bread are in the commodity food program. And fry bread is essentially trying to do the best that you can with your commodities, flour, lard, and uh, vegetable shortening. 
over generations, when people grow up with that, it becomes a part yeah. of the culture. It, it becomes acculturated into the community that that is part of the norm. There is only one small market on the 581 square mile Gila River Reservation with a small produce section. A regular supermarket is an hour's round trip drive. If you're in an impoverished community and you don't have healthy choices for food and you don't have safe places to exercise, you're tremendously disempowered when it comes to a disease like diabetes. And that has nothing to do with how much medication is in the pharmacy. It has everything to do with social determinants of health, which include that sense of control, that sense of self-empowerment that is important to all of us, whether we're Native or non-Native. It has an impact on self-identity, and it has an impact on one's sense of hope for the future. Some of our people have just given up. Our people lost their identity when we lost our water. Within our community, we have elders that have gone. I always have that in the back of my mind, that those people will never see the water. When I leave the reservation and I see those same people that live out there and use that water, how, how they've benefited from, from our loss. They've benefited it so much for so many years. Decisions to benefit some are made every day. They create winners and losers in wealth and in health. In upscale cities like Scottsdale, Arizona, the diabetes rate is only around 5%. In less affluent towns like Bullhead City, the rate is closer to 11%. And on some poor Native American reservations, it continues to be 50%. This is a disease pattern repeated across the country, across the world, and not just for diabetes. Whether you are poor or wealthy or in between is a powerful predictor of how healthy your life will be.